Well, good evening and welcome to the Commemorative Air Force Warbird Tube webinar for this evening. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and we are certainly glad that uh, you can join us tonight. Uh, this webinar series is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force. You can support the uh, CAF through membership or donations, and for details on how you can further CAF's mission to educate, inspire, and honor, please visit our website, commemorativeairforce.org. Now, as you enjoy the presentation tonight, and trust me, I think you will enjoy tonight's presentation, some questions may come to mind. Uh, just type it in the chat box, or if you're watching on uh, uh, Facebook or YouTube, just in the, in the comment section, uh, Leo is monitoring uh, all of our different social media channels that uh, are broadcasting this, and uh, she'll ship the questions off to me and I will uh, uh, try to interject them with our uh, our guest uh, for tonight, who is CAF's resident historian, Brad Pilgrim. And uh, tonight we continue our uh, CAF history series. We're going to look back at the second half of a very influential decade in CAF history, and that is the second half of the 1970s. Uh, Brad, good evening and uh, welcome back. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. Well, as I said, this uh, the 70s. We uh, a couple of weeks ago we looked at the uh, the first half of the 70s, and this really, um, you know, the, the first uh, 20 years of the organization, uh, a lot of things were happening. The 60s saw, you know, quite a quite a bit of uh, acquisition of the fighters. Starts with the bombers. We got more aircraft in the in the early 70s, and then after that, CAF starts to really kind of uh, pick up some steam. So we're going to kind of pick things up, I guess, in uh, in 1976. Yeah, by, by 76, the CF had kind of gotten out of the cow pasture mode and had turned into a world-renowned, well, very well-known professional flying organization. They were already the largest collector of warbirds, flying warbirds for certain at the time. Um, they had moved into the new museum in Harlingen, the new facility, and uh, were having the world's largest warbird shows by that time. And, you know, the 1975 air show, was probably the largest warbird air show that had ever happened, purely warbirds. And so by the time 1976 rolled around, uh, they had a lot, the CF had a lot to live up to. They had already done so many really cool things and, and, and acquired some really cool airplanes. Now it was time to start getting them into better shape and start being more professional and uh, presenting themselves a little more than just the good old boys flying club, which it hadn't been for a long time, but now they were on the national stage and had to act that way. So the the first, um, the membership meeting, I thought about this the other day when we had the membership meeting at the air show uh, here in Dallas. Um, this is the membership meeting in 1976, and you'd see Lefty Gardner standing up there uh, at the podium and Ed Messick over there on the right, and I think that's Vernon Thorpe between the two of them. This is when they voted for general staff. This is when they, you know, did the state of the CAF and all the things that we still do today. Back then, the elections were a lot more spirited than they are now. There were there were people politicking for each other. There, you didn't just stand up and and nominate someone from the floor. You went around with buttons saying "vote for Lefty" and stuff like that. I mean, that was it was genuinely a political thing to get a general staff member elected back then. And so the some of those meetings wound up fairly rowdy. I remember one or two of them as a kid, just hearing them from the outside in the hallway or whatever. There were a lot of, a lot of, I learned a lot of dirty words standing out there in the hallway listening to it. So, but anyway, that right there is the Colonel's registration for the air show. Um, back then, you didn't have, ladies weren't allowed to be colonels. They weren't allowed to be genuine members. And uh, they had the, the women's auxiliary of the CAF, and then you just had the colonel's ladies. And these ladies right here, that's all the registration packages for all the colonels that showed up at Harlingen that year. And that's them going, when you showed up to check in, you had to talk to them, and they had to pull out your room reservation and all that. So that's just a neat picture from back in those days. Now it's digital for the most part. That's right. Uh, do, you, do you happen to know, uh, and uh, Kevin, totally off the cuff on you, but um, about how many members CAF had in 76? Um, I want to say in 1978, they had 2,800 members. So they probably had something around 2,500, something like that at that point. I'm not certain exactly. Um, that is, that's inside the fighter hangar. That was the first year they had the trade show. 
And what that was, that's where everybody set up all their wares. Everybody, it's like when you go to Oshkosh and you go into the sales barn. That's kind of what this was. All the units had their PXs set up there. And uh, that's where you went in and bought your, you know, got uh, got uh, uh, Pappy Boynton's autograph and stuff like that. He would have the table set up in there. And so that's what that is. And that's the tradition that, you know, it still goes on today. Every air show you go to, there's a, a PX section. And that was the original in there in CES. 1976, Prince Philip was flying from Mexico City up to Indianapolis, I believe it was. And the CF somehow found out he was going to be landing in Brownsville. I don't know how they found that out. But they quickly got every airplane they could find with British markings or Canadian markings or had been used by them. And all the crew members they could find that spoke what they called acceptable English. And they went and, and were lined up there all standing at attention with, with two C series, a B-25, a P-40, and something else all lined up there. And Prince Philip wasn't supposed to get off the airplane, but he did. And he came over and met everybody and shook hands and they led him around. And uh, he lay, he did a flyby down down uh, Rebel Field there in Harlingen with all the warbirds giving him an escort. And that was in 1976. And he la he later became an honorary member of the CAF. And probably the most famous honorary member of the CAF outside of maybe a you know Chuck Yeager or somebody like that. Sure. I mean, literally have the guy that was married to the Queen of England be a member of the organization. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And. Uh, Describe the uniform that the gentleman next to him is is wearing. Is that was that I've not seen that before. That's a guy that. named Gary, and Gary Wolf was a. I don't know if he was British or if he was South African or what. But I remember he had an accent, and um, that was I think it was called the, the C uniform. There was the Class A, Class B, and the Class C, and the Class C was just a flight suit. And all that is is basically one of those Dickies work coveralls from Sears. It was gray and had the, you can see it has the headquarters unit there on, on the chest there. Okay. And uh, I don't know why I had the beret. That that I don't understand. I've, I've never understood people who wear berets, unless they're a you know, French skunk or something like that. That'd be <laughs> love you, baby. And that's Douglas Bader. You know, he's a, a famous British ace from World War II, fought in the Battle of Britain, ended up in a German POW camp. He lost both of his legs in a flying accident right before the war started, and he fought the war with two ten legs. And uh, so he's famous as being a legless ace. Well, he was uh, still a pilot long after the war and everything like that, and he became an honorary member of the CAF. And uh, he uh, uh, did a lot of things with, with the British wing that we used to have, the old British wing. We've had a couple since then. He did a lot of things. He was very helpful when it came to needing the British government to, to uh, cooperate with things. And whenever Prince Philip got his commission, he's actually the one who gave him his certificate and everything. But that's Douglas Bader with his certificate and with his Confederate you know, Air Force hat on. In 1976, Paul Tibbetts, who's probably the most famous B-29 pilot to ever live, besides maybe David Oliver, I don't know. But, uh, you know, Paul Tibbetts is... And literally, literally the most famous one ever. He joined the CAF, and the last time he had flown a B-29 is when he delivered Enola Gay to the Smithsonian, and it was in Chicago at the time, uh, and that was like in 1946 or 47. And so in 1976, he joined the CAF and checked out and started flying Fifi. And during the weekend air show, that's when he got his check, uh, his check ride done and all that. And uh, Randy Sohn was his instructor pilot. Ronnie Gardner was his uh, flight engineer. That's Warren Earhart there in the middle, facing away from us. And then that's Dick Agather behind Paul Tibbetts. Uh, Bill Crump took this photo, the famous aviation photographer, Bill Crump. He was inside the plane and took all these pictures of Paul Tibbetts uh, rechecking the airplane. But uh, 1976 air show was the year that the CAF had something happen that really got their name very well known. Of course, Paul Tibbetts is known as being the man who flew the Enola Gay and dropped the atomic bomb. Well, the CF this year decided to reenact the atomic bomb dropping. And that's that's Paul Tibbetts and Dick Agatha standing there. Um, they decided to reenact this atomic bomb dropping. And Bill McCoy was the guy who ran the, the bomb squad. That's Randy Sohn and Paul Tibbetts. And you see Paul Tibbetts has the original brown leather 
CAF edition of the flight manual underneath his arm. And I think that may be Bill Becker with his back towards us. I, I can't tell. But this is Randy Sohn and Paul Tibbetts and then Ronnie Gardner. And then that's Bill Crump on the right, the photographer. And Ronnie was uh, you know, inducted to the Hall of Fame last time we had the induction in 2019. So really neat guy. You see the Timex sign behind right above Paul Tibbetts' head. Um, Vic Agather was on the board of Timex. And he got like a $25,000 donation. It was a big donation from them to help restore Fifi. And all they wanted in return was they wanted Timex. And then their old saying of takes a licking, keeps on ticking. Mm -hmm. And that was on both sides of the airplane under the engineer's window and the navigator's window. They filmed a TV commercial where they attached a Timex watch to the propeller blade of the airplane and filmed it and said, takes a licking, keeps on ticking cranked the engine up. Well, it was only supposed to just crank up and then shut down real quick. Well, it got misunderstood or something, but they advanced the throttle. And according to Randy Sohn, somewhere out in Harlingen, Texas, out in the ground, there's a Timex watch that we never found again. He goes, it just sailed across. Well, that, that Timex logo was only on there for a very few weeks. And I tell people all the time that must have been the most photographed time period in Fifi's history because there's a million pictures of Fifi with Timex on there, making you think it was there for years. It wasn't. It was there for just a very few weeks because the general staff made the big actor give the money back to Timex and made them remove the logo off the airplane and told them that we are not in the business of being a flying billboard. And so Vic Agatha, very, very upset with the general staff over that, gave the money back. And that was the end of our sponsorship by Timex. And back then, $25,000 yeah. would have went a long way with the V-29. And, you know, 40 years later, 50 years later, we're trying to get people to sponsor our airplanes and everything like right. that. So that was probably a short-sighted, a short-sighted thing that was done. But that was for a very short time period. And people think it was on there for years. Kind of a neat well, story, though. Yeah, it, it's funny that uh, there's so many pictures, as you point out, with the Timex logo on there that yep. it actually the general staff was a little too late in in uh, having him take it off because it's that billboard still is is all over. Um, yep. it, we, like you said, in pictures all over the world, even today, even though it was there just oh, yeah. for a short period of time. Yep. Well, and what's even funnier is they made them take this off in 1976, but 1979. They painted the, the left front Bombay door of Fifi with an advertisement for Air Show 79 and flew it around with the Bombay <laughs> doors open. So, but the exact words I was told was, we're not a NASCAR franchise. We're not going to have logos plastered over our airplanes. And so that, that kind of stopped. The CAF probably made a tactical error in, in judgment that day. They should have started chasing corporate sponsorships a little more back then. Yeah. But live and learn. So, speaking of live and learn, this, <laughs> speaking of living and learn, um, Paul Tibbetts was flying Fifi in 1976. Bill McCoy was the guy in charge of the pyro team. They decided to reenact the atomic bombing. Um, it was not like they were over there worshiping the atomic bomb or nothing like that. It was literally a part of the air power demonstration. And uh, there was a news reporter there who wrote this story about how the commemorative or the Confederate Air Force at the time was glorifying war and glorifying the atomic bomb and all this. It got picked up by the Associated Press. And within 24 hours, it was all over the world. Um, I've got in my office, I've got newspapers from Hong Kong, Manila, and uh, Tokyo, and like five other places where this story was printed about how the CAF was glorifying this war. And then worse, Paul Tibbetts, the man who dropped the first atomic bomb, was the man doing it, reliving the glory of getting to kill all these Japanese. Well, the Japanese demanded an apology. Lloyd Nolan and the CAF said no. There was no way they were going to apologize for anything. There was a letter that went out to all the members of the CAF. I've got a copy of it, and they said, we will not apologize. We have nothing to apologize for. This is a historical fact. This is not about glorifying war. This is about ensuring people don't forget. And uh, the the State Department actually apologized to the Japanese government. And, and Lloyd Nolan told him, he said, you better not do it on behalf of the CAF. He said, you can apologize on behalf of yourself. He said, but do not apologize on behalf of us because we're not sorry. And so 
they finally decided, the CF decided, well, we just won't, we'll tone it down. They didn't say we're going to cut it out, but they said we'll tone it down in the future and, and we won't, you know, we'll change the way we present this because we don't want to be mean or nothing like that, but it's a historical fact and it needs to be done. And the only reason they agreed to do that is because the Department of Defense, Lloyd Nolan had a meeting with, with the Department of Defense, and they convinced him that the Japanese were upset enough about this particular incident that there was a good possibility we would lose our ability to base our carriers in Japan. And that would, would affect us from a, you know, a, a, a military standpoint. And so that's the only reason the CF agreed to tone it down a little bit. But the way they toned it down was 1977, Paul Tibbetts flew the, flew the atomic bomb demo again, but they presented it as, you know, very sad, very sorry, very somber moment. Uh, they didn't say if Japanese started it, we ended it. It was nothing like that. It was a, a professional way of doing it. And this was kind of before we really started the whole air power demonstration that started with 1939 and ended with 45. Back then, it was kind of just, you know, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor here, B-17s fly, Mustangs fly, B-29 flies, air show's over. And so it became a little more organized of an air show after that, kind of because, because of this. But there was news articles all over the, you can Google it, and there's a lot of stuff on Google about, uh, uh, you know, these articles you can find where people bring it up from time to time. Uh, especially on August 6th, every year somebody brings this up to see if it's still glorifying it. But in reality, it was probably probably one of the better things the CF ever did because Transpo 72 that we talked about last time, the big air show in D.C., that put the CF on a national stage. And we became really well known in the U.S. This is the letter to the members from, it says Jethro Culpepper, but it was actually from Lloyd Nolan explaining our position on it. But because of the worldwide press attention on this event, the CF became known internationally. Everybody knew who the CF was because this was on every news story. Walter Cronkite talked about it. I mean, everybody did. And one of the things that was really interesting is there was a House, Resolu House Resolution 10101, I think was the number of it, that basically what it was was a bill that did away with fuel excise taxes and federal airways taxes for nonprofit aviation museums. And the CF was going to take that rebate money and apply it towards the maintenance fund. It came up to be signed into law by President Ford seven days after this atomic bomb thing happened at the air show. And some of his aides, they say, actually told him, you don't want to sign this because of what the Confederate Air Force just did. So the President of the United States knew who the Confederate Air Force was because of this atomic bombing. Well, he went ahead, uh, you know, President Ford went ahead and signed it into, I'm sorry, Carter went ahead and signed it into, into law. No, I guess it would be Ford in 76. I was three years old. I don't remember. But he went ahead and signed it into, he signed it into law, but everybody in the government knew the name Confederate Air Force because of tie-in with this House resolution and then with the atomic bomb happening at the same time. So it was a bad mistake with Timex. This was probably a good mistake. Well, it, it, the old saying goes, "There's no such thing as bad press," uh, and and this exactly. it, it, this is a textbook example of that. Um, and I, I think also, uh, and obviously, looking looking back through the lens of history, 1976 is a lot different than 2021. Um, but CAF standing up and saying, "No, we're not going to apologize. This is this is history. We're telling the story. We're remembering." Mm -hmm. um, you know, they. Uh, they could get away with that then, probably not as much uh, today. But it it is interesting that, to to think of the organization, uh, basically standing up to the to the government before the Department of Defense gets in and says, "Okay, look, uh, we need your help." <laughs> uh, but uh, amazing that the, that a, a small group of of World War II enthusiasts in in you know. Uh, Southern Texas can can have uh, an influence over yeah. the uh, the policies of, of the United States and uh, actually two world governments. So it's <laughs> yeah, it's quite, quite an interesting yeah. uh, chapter in CAF's history. Yeah, I thought I think that's one of the neater episodes of the '70s that a lot of people don't know about. But people need to Google it. It's it's a pretty neat story 
once you start reading into it. I've got a lot of the general staff meet, uh, minutes and a lot of Lloyd Dolan's notes about this entire thing that it, it's very colorful, I guess is the easiest way to say it. Someday it'll be in the book. There you go. Probably some some sleepless nights in in Harlingen between uh, the general staff and the and the, the the paid staff of the organization trying to figure out how to navigate this. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I can only imagine what would have happened if the internet had been around back then. <laughs> you know. Very true. Very true. Paul Tibbetts, uh, he continued to fly PT up until the the mid eighties. He was just the normal tour pilot. He went out, you know, he was a very successful commercial jet executive. He owned that, you know, a jet uh, leasing company and everything in, in Ohio. But he would come out and fly Fifi just as a normal crew member. And uh, his name and address was on the crew roster like everybody else's. He didn't talk about the atomic bomb. You know, but he didn't want the attention on him. He wanted it on Fifi. If you asked him about it, he would happily talk about it. He had no trouble talking about it. But he was just a normal pilot, just like any of our other pilots are today. And uh, and he flew Fifi for many, many years. And uh, he said numerous times that if he had it all to do over again, same situation, same circumstances, he would do nothing different. He said, I never lost a single night's sleep over what I did with the atomic bomb. He said, that was ending the war. He said, I was doing my job. And so... I guess that's a pretty content man just to be able to say that, but he's a, uh, he was a legendary guy, but in the ranks of the CAF, he was just another, just another Colonel. And 76 is the first year that the dispatch was printed as a normal magazine. Prior to that, it had come out as a kind of a, you know, stapled together six sheets of paper or whatever. And I've got all of those from 1960, I guess it was all the way up, but 1976 was when they first turned it into a actual magazine, which is kind of interesting. I thought that was a good picture, and I had it laying on my desk, so I took that picture. <laughs> 1977 rolled around. Uh, the fleet pinch was donated to the CF. This one is down here in Texas, not you know just south of Dallas here in Granbury now. It uh, just came up from the Rio Grande Valley wing. And uh, it's in the process of being re returned to airworthiness. That's actually the oldest airplane the CF has. I think that airplane was built in 1938, if I remember right. But that's the actual, the oldest uh, airplane the CF has. I've got the original logbook from that airplane from when it left the factory and went to the Canadian military and uh, was used as a trainer in Canada. I've got that original logbook somewhere in here in the collection. Um, I'm going to give it to the sponsor, the sponsor group of this airplane now that they're down here south of me. Whenever I have a chance, I'm going to take it to them. But that's when we first got the airplane. Today it's in, in, in British training colors, but it was in American colors at the time. The P-82 twin Mustang, you know, we, we, we talked about this before. We got it in 1969, I think it was. Blew it into headquarters and all that. And then they started restoring it. Well, it was in a lot worse shape than they thought it was. And they finally flew it for the first time just prior to the air show in 1977. And uh, this is this is the airplane in flight. Um, you know, today there's only one flyable P-82. At the time, there was only one flyable P-82. And uh, this one flew for several years, and then you know ended up having a landing accident in the in the mid '80s. And uh, is back with the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, today on display. But this is when it was a live animal and was still flying around. Um, we later painted it black, not fighter colors, but this is what it was originally done as when the CF first had it. It was a very troublemaking airplane. It always had mechanical problems, but when it flew, it was really neat to see. It was really neat to see. Do you know uh, the, the history of that, that particular airframe before CAF obtained it? I don't think it was, I don't think it was a combat airplane at all. I've never found anything that said it was. It was like a trainer or something like that. And it wound up on static display at Kelly Air Force Base in San Antonio, right by Lackland. And there was two of them on display there. And one of them is still on outside display. It's been sitting there since the 50s. And this one, the CAF got it on loan, depending on who you ask. The CAF said they got it donated. The Air Force later said it was on loan. I've seen the paperwork. It sure looked like it was donated to me. But either way, they ferried it in from Kelly Air Force Base down to Harlingen. A guy named Joe Alagrante was the guy who flew it in. He was a NASA test pilot and had several thousand hours in P-82s. And he was the normal pilot for several years. Then Ronnie Gardner and Lefty 
flew it and and uh, uh of course uh Ed Messix was the guy flying and went and had to land an accident in the eighties. Neat airplane. Yeah. That's the TBM that's up in Colorado. Uh in nineteen seventy seven it was taken out to California. A guy named Bob Wick uh flew it out to California and it was in that movie The Close Encounters of the Third Kind. If you remember it's a Steven Spielberg movie and uh about, you know, aliens and all that. Well at the very beginning of the movie guys find these TBM Avengers that were just deposited out in the middle of the desert somewhere and the planes were still in good shape and still had gas in them able to start them. Well, it was in the movie, it was flight 19 that, you know, disappeared in the, the Bermuda triangle. Well, the CAS TBM was used in that movie and we still have that airplane today. And this is probably the first use of a CF airplane in a major movie. They'd been used in other movies, but this was the first major movie that we used the CF airplane in. Right. I, in previous, uh, you know, the Battle of Britain movie uh, featured mm. some CAF pilots, but uh, really the, the airplanes themselves were not part of the, the CAF fleet at the time. Not really. I mean, two of them yeah. technically belonged to us, but we bought them with the provision that they would use them in the movie. So we kind of twisted their big toe till they let us do it. In this yeah. case, they came hunting planes of fame, actually, in Chino, California, were the ones tasked with gathering up airplanes. And they came to the CAF. Even though there was a lot of TBMs flying around as bug sprayers and fire bombers and all that, there was only a few that were actually, you know, Warbirds and ours and then Connie Edwards over in Big Spring, him and his brother, Butto, they had a TBM, which is out in California today. In fact, it's in Chino today. Uh, their TBM is in that movie also, but those, because those are about the only Warbird TBMs that were around back then. Right. There were, I mean, as you mentioned, the rest were, were working aircraft. Uh, yeah. Either as, as as sprayers or fire bombers, and yeah, very very few. Mm -hmm. it, it is yeah. interesting as you as you watch the progression of the CAF. It's also it parallels the the warbird movement itself, starting from very very humble roots, almost kind of oh, yeah. fun amateurish sort of warbird movement in, in the very early '60s to where it is as we're talking now in in the mid '70s, which. Um, you know, you, you start to get into uh, the, you know, the authentic paint schemes and trying to the restorations and, and uh, more professional operations, as it were. Right. This, the 70s really were the last days of the affordable Warbird movement. Right. It started getting in the 80s. 1977, the CAF Tonkel arrived. Uh, it was in the Battle of Britain movie. Um, it uh, flew over. It was ferried over to Bangor, Maine, and then an American crew took it, and then they flew it on down, and it arrived at the headquarters just in time for Air Show 77. And uh, that's it after it arrived. This is this is not it on arrival. This is after we painted it and everything. But the Heinkel was a neat airplane. There was there was only, it was the only one in the world still flying uh, at the time. Um, and it was the only one that was flying anywhere as a warbird. You know, the Spanish had just retired them in 1974. This was 77. This one came to the U.S. and then immediately the crew went back over to England or to Spain, actually, and picked up a second one and brought it back. And that's the one that the Cavanaugh Museum has here in Addison today. Um, that is Rob Diver on the left with the glasses on and then Peter Hoare and Neil, Neil Williams. They're the ones who ferried the Heinkel over and then immediately turned around and went back and got the other Heinkel, brought it back to the to Harlingen and it's in Cavanaugh today. And then they went back to get a third one, and Neil Williams and another guy were flying, and his wife were flying that one and crashed into a mountain in Spain and uh, got got killed. But um, Rob Diver there on the left is still alive, lives up here in Sherman and uh, not far from me, and is, is still around. And his, and his son, Simon, is a CF member down in Central Texas, mm -hmm. uh, heavily involved in the CF still. And Rob was a British guy. But he had an American A and P license for mechanic, along with a British license. And so he he was instrumental in bringing a lot of airplanes. Later on, when we got to J fifty two to the U S, he was responsible for that as well. So he was a very involved guy with the CS. But sadly, that airplane it, you know was lost in an accident, and we don't have it anymore. This is when the airplane was was picked up in Bangor, Maine, by the Americans. That's Lou Hilton on the right. Somebody in the Air Force, some colonel. Lefty Gardner, and I cannot remember the other guy's name on the left, but this is when they picked it up there. And uh, uh, Lefty had flown a Heinkel once before in Spain during the Battle of Britain movie. He had flown a Heinkel once from like 
the co-pilot seat where they swung the yoke over and he could fly it. And he's like, sure, I can fly. It's just like a C-47 within nine engines. So they went and picked it up in Maine, having a grand total of five minutes in the airplane and flew it back to Texas. So, My goodness. And uh, looking at that picture, is just a little bit of oil on the on the cowling. Just a little bit. Considering that thing had just flown across the North Atlantic, that ain't bad. I would yeah. take that every day. So. This is Franz Stigler, and this is nineteen seventy six. He was he was a he was a Luftwaffe fighter ace, and uh, he got shot down twelve times during the war. He bailed out six times, crash landed six times in North Africa, and then finally in in Europe. But uh, he came to Harlingen in nineteen seventy five for the air show with his uh, I'm sorry seventy six with his Emmy one hundred eight Messerschmitt, and then he came back in 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 seventy seven for the uh, American Fighter Races reunion, and he came as a guest of them. And I don't remember if he ever actually became a CF honorary member or member or what, but he he came to air shows several times. Um, he's the guy that I, I put this in here because he's the guy that a lot of people know the story of Ye Old Pub, which is the B-17 that was flying back, all shot up from bombing Germany, and this Messerschmitt came up and saw how badly damaged it was. And Ed, instead of shooting them down, he escorted them on across where they could escape and make it home. That was Franz Stiegler who did that. And the interesting thing, and I don't say this for any particular reason, but I just think it's interesting. In the 70s, when he was first becoming known here in the U.S. as, as, a, as a Luftwaffe ace, he lived in Canada at the time, the whole ye old pub story was never told. Nobody had ever heard that story. It never came out. I knew him fairly well when I lived up in Washington State because he lived not far from Abbotsford, British Columbia, and we went to a lot of air shows. And I had a lot of friends that were you know, mutual friends with him. Very nice guy, very neat guy, uh, just a genuine pleasure to hang out with. He was just an old fighter pilot, you know. But I never heard the story about Ye Old Pub until the book about it came out. And then suddenly that's all anybody knew about Franz Stiegler. But one of the interesting things about him and uh, he had a he had a scar right here in the middle of his forehead, and I asked him. I said, "How did you get that?" And he said, "Well, he said I came up behind the B-17 one day. He said, and I was fixing to shoot it down. He said, then I noticed the tail guns were pointing down. He said, and I saw the tail gunner was slumped forward. And he said, I thought, man, I don't want to shoot this plane down. Those guys are all shot up, or whatever. And he said, so I got closer to him, just kind of looking at the guy. He goes, he wasn't dead. He lifted those guns up and pulled the trigger." He said, my windshield exploded. He said, a 50 caliber bullet went through that windscreen and hit me in the forehead. He said, and I had to bail out of the airplane because the plane was all shot up. He said, all the way down, all I could think to myself was, I wasn't going to shoot him. Why did he shoot me? But he had this neat scar in his forehead, and he loved to tell the story about how being stupid got him shot down, got himself shot down. He was a very neat guy. He passed away several years ago, but he was a, he was a very interesting fellow. And that's him, his uniform picture from earlier in the war. That is Adolf Galan. A lot of people know him. He's, you know, the, you know, the general of fighters in the Luftwaffe in World War II. He was familiar with the CAF and Lefty and Lloyd and Connie and everybody because of the Battle of Britain movie. He was a technical advisor on that, and uh, he was was joined the CAF and was uh, inducted as a colonel. And this is at Winter Show 77 is where this is happening at. That's Eddie May, the mouth of the South, who we talked about last time, used to be the air show announcer. That's Eddie May putting his, his uh, wings on him. But that's from that's from the Winter Show in 1977 is where that happened at. So that's another famous German amongst amongst our crowd. And, of course, was, we, have to, was, we have to point out the uh, the shirt and tie of the, of the uh, gentleman next to him. That's, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, very, very late 70s. Very flammable. That's very flammable polyester he's wearing in that picture. And that that is the Rebel Ball. That's the event we were just talking about. And at this time, this was the 13th annual one in 1977. And there was 230 members were inducted into the CAF that night. And that's Eddie May reading the the CFO. And, you know, this, this last air show, the uh, last weekend, I forgot how many people Hank inducted 
but it was a good I, number. It was, uh, I believe yeah. it was well over 100. Yeah. yeah, it was well over 100. It was a good number, but this time at this point, 230, there was two, there was, there was 2,800 members of the CAS in 1977. Yep. And 230 people was a pretty big batch. But I think in 1979, there was like 270 were inducted. So the numbers grew. And I remember one time in the 80s, there was over 500 people inducted at air show. One day they read the, the oath and all that out in front of the crowd. But this one, the interesting thing about this is it's kind of hard to tell in the picture. It's actually outside because they had so many people to induct. It wouldn't fit into the ballroom at the officer's club. So they built a stage out in the lawn. And this is actually taken out. I have another picture that's not as good of a picture, but it's from a different angle. And you can see the palm trees behind them. And then I found the general staff minutes where they talked about how many were inducted. Interesting. Uh, yeah. For those who, who may have missed it the, the last time when we talked about the Rebel Ball, just explain a little bit about about uh, what that was. And, and as you said, it, it took place in, in winter in, in Texas, which for the rest of us yeah. is really not, not too wintry, but... <laughs> not a bad place to be in the winter the, the right. rebel ball was it was basically an old it was based on the old south cotillion you know and and where they used to have the big parties at the plantations and stuff where everybody showed up in their finest and all that and originally people wore the old the ladies would wear the big ball gowns with the hoop skirts and the men would wear the you know the the old pre-civil war uh suits and stuff like that and it was just it was just a big party it was just a big dance is all it was and they they'd sit around they'd eat barbecue and it was just an excuse for everybody to get get together that wasn't necessarily about flying it's probably the only really non-flying thing they did in truth it was probably done to please some of the wives um i have seen this written before that they wanted to do something that included the ladies because like i said earlier the ladies weren't allowed to be members at the time and so, but they were a lot of help. They did a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. And I think the Rebel Ball probably started as a way to have a, a, a get together for the for the wives to get to go out and do something and and be thanked, publicly thanked for their support of the CES. But some of those parties got pretty wild too. But they, they, we had them all the way up until we moved to, we moved to Midland. Um, the, they had a couple in, the mid, in Midland in the early 90s. I don't know when the last one was held. But it just just kind of fell out of favor over the years. But you see all the guys wearing the continental ties, you know, the the Kentucky tie they call it. Um, they people wore tuxedos, women wore prom dresses. It was it was a grown up prom, is all it was. And that is the famous blue book. That's actually the second blue book. And people talk about those. There's there's three things people talk about when they're talking about the blue book. There was that one right there that was sold in 1976. If you ever read one, it covers the CF from the beginning of time up until 1976. And they sold them out of Dispatch Magazine and out of the PX for $19.95 in the beginning of 1977. And um, 1979, they revised it, just changed a couple of things, not much, didn't really add anything new to it, and started selling it again for $25 in 1979. But there was another blue book before that that I don't have a copy laying here, but it was a real thin one, just kind of almost like a newspaper print thing. That was the original blue book. And that pretty much uh, supported Fifi the first two years that that airplane was flying. Vic Agatha financed the printing of the original blue book. And I forgot how many hundreds of thousands of dollars the CF made off of that thing. They sold them for $5 a piece and the B-29 got $3 out of every five. And that financed the airplane for a long time. In 1977, this magazine was printed. And they just call it the Ghost Squadron magazine. This was the third blue book. And you can nearly tell someone what generation they're from when they refer to the blue book. If I wasn't into the CF historical stuff, the one I just showed you is the one I think of as the blue book. But there's two other versions of it. We've talked about making another one, but uh, it would be extremely expensive to do it nowadays. And print media just is not as popular as it used to be. I think the idea of another blue book is a really cool idea. But uh, that kind of, I think those days are past. You could maybe do a digital one or something like that. But that book right there, you can find them on eBay and everything. That's one of the best books about the history of the CF that you'll ever find. And the funny thing is th this book here, um, all this is, 
is basically a compilation of 1976 and 1977 CF dispatches. That's essentially what it is with a little bit extra stuff put in that they could sell for the general public. They sold in the PX for five bucks. I bought my very first one at the PX in Harlingen for $5 and I still have it. It's stapled together because I read it so much as a kid, but I do still have that original book. This is about the time that Devil Dog came into the CF. There was a couple of members of the CF that owned the airplane before. And then they donated it, or the CF ended up buying it. That's Ronnie Gardner there in the middle of the tall guy. And then that's Ozzy Parrish on the far right. He was the original crew chief on Devil Dog. Of course, today, Devil Dog, I would argue, is the most famous B-25 in America. Thank you most, uh, mostly thanks to Beth Ann. Um, they have campaigned that airplane harder. If other people campaign an airplane as hard as the Devil Dog Squadron does, the CF would be a whole different animal. But the Devil Dog, um, that's one of its about five iterations of nose art that it's had over the years. But this is very soon after they first restored the airplane and started flying it. That's the, the headquarters staff maintenance crew. That's most of, most of them are the line boys that work there. But that's before they put the picture on there. They just had the name. And notice it doesn't have guns in the nose or anything like that. That was a very bare bones airplane at the time. It kind of was just kind of put together and painted is what it amounted to. That's what it looked like when it showed up. There was three members of the CF owned it. They started restoring it and then CF purchased it very cheaply. And uh, over the years, it's turned into the beautiful airplane that it is today. That's it on one of the first test flights. And notice it has the guns in it there, and here it has the guns in it as well. I was at Harlingen in 1985, I think it was, and they were doing a run-up on Devil Dog. And I think it was the right side brake that failed. And it jumped the chalk, and the airplane did about a 60-degree turn and hit the power cart that was sitting there and broke a propeller blade out of the hub. And the blade was sailing out across the ramp and landed out there and, and – uh, they had, I remember them having a, a bucket in front of it to donate to, to fix that airplane. That was the first time I remember seeing Devil Dog. I, I've seen it before, but it's the first time I remember distinctly looking at it. It had that broken propeller from the brake failure. But I don't know why I just thought of that. I just did just now. <laughs> 1977 also, the, the, the A-20 had it. The CF got it in 1963. Flew it into Mercedes, Brownfield, Brownwood first, and then to Mercedes, and then it came to Harlingen, and uh, didn't really do much. It was just a flying rattle trap at the time because it had been neglected for many years before the CF bought it. And so in 1977, they finally finished the restoration of it and got the airplane painted and got it on, uh, got it into uh, working condition. And and right right before Air Show 77 is when they debuted the airplane. And I think the next picture shows what they what they wound up with. That's what the airplane looked like later on. It had a skull painted on the nose and uh, for years was the only flying A-20 Havoc in the world. There was another one that was flyable, but just no one ever flew it. And that's the one that Rod Lewis owns today. But uh, at the time, this was the most, the only flying one and certainly the most regular flying A-20 in the world. Of course, it, it got lost in uh, 1987, I think it was, uh, with Max Gardner. Uh, had a heart attack while flying the airplane, unfortunately, and, and, and died. But uh, they put a lot of money into that airplane. It was really just, it was a neat airplane. I wish we had another one. Maybe someday we'll get one. That's class of 44. 1978, the Arizona wing was formed. The Colorado wing was formed. But the Arizona wing, a guy named Mike Clark donated this airplane class of 44, and it became Sentimental Journey. And so it came to Air Show 77 in 1978. It became the CS airplane. Um, it uh, flew in formation in 1977 with Texas Raiders at the air show and then came back in 78. And was I believe it was already painted as Sentimental Journey by that point. And the way they got the name Sentimental Journey, they had a contest there in Arizona, um, a contest to pick the most popular name. And that's where the nose art of Betty Grable and the name Sentimental Journey that's on it today. And it's definitely one of the top two prettiest B-17s in the world today. I'll let everyone else decide what their favorite is, but it's one of the top two prettiest B-17s in the world. That was the year we got that was 1978. 
this I just thought was interesting being a historian. These are the three belt buckles. One was pewter, one was silver, and one was gold plated, I believe. And they sold for $889 out of the back of this patch. Um, when I first started collecting CAS stuff, I found this set down in, at, at a, uh, at a estate sale and I bought it for $12. And then I bought another one for $26. And I don't think anybody in the world would pay $889 for them. But they, this, and then, then they had a, a, a 45 ton, a, a 45 Colt pistol that was done up in CF markings. And those two things sold within a year of each other. And that was the most expensive souvenir the CF ever sold that wasn't an actual airplane. And they sold several hundred of these sets. It wasn't as successful as they had hoped it would be. And they're kind of rare today. And then they issued separate sets with just one belt buckle in it. And there was one you could buy for 450 bucks. It was two belt buckles, but that set with three with the, with the case and numbered and all that kind of stuff was $889. Mine came from garage sales and the state sales. So they do show up on eBay from time to time. 1978 Diamond Lil uh, had kind of fallen into disrepair. Um, the airplane didn't have a squadron or anything like that. And so they started their own squadron, a guy named Milton Wu, who had been a B-17 ball turret gunner um, during the war. He got talked into being the squadron leader, and they started their own support squadron, and the B-29 and B-24 were separate at the time. And it was, I think, 1980, 1980 or 82 when the B-29 squadron and the B-24 squadron merged. But, you know, we got the airplane in 1968, and it wasn't until 1978 that it had its own dedicated squadron to keep the airplane going. It had gotten pretty ratty at this point. So air, aircraft that at, at the time that weren't assigned to a unit, I mean, that was just the purview of headquarters to help keep them up? Um, yeah, pretty pretty much. I mean, you, you had individuals who, who worked on them and stuff like that. But like the B-24 and so many other parts, we didn't have units all over the country at the time. I think in 1977, we had 12 wings, if I remember right. So we didn't have all the units all over the country. And at Harlingen, it was not uncommon at all. They have 40 airplanes there. And like the Marauder was there, the A-20 was there, two A-26s were there, two B-25s, B-24. So just you would find guys who would all pitch in together to operate the airplane. But then they finally decided, like with this one, we need a dedicated group that does nothing but mess with this B-24. Because it had turned into an eyesore at that point. And was in, in pretty bad shape. It had just parked outside and hadn't flown for a couple of years. The 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 B twenty four, all the years we owned it, it didn't fly for the first ten years. It didn't fly, but maybe sixty seventy hours. Since then, it's flown a lot. And this last year, they've flown the pants off that girl, and and the airplane's doing very well right now. But in nineteen seventy eight, it was kind of an orphan child, and that's when it first got its own support group. Now, even though the, the aircraft may have been based in Harlingen, the, you, there were still aircraft sponsors who were helping to uh, support yeah. and fly the airplane, right? Yeah, you still had sponsors and headquarters would say, hey, we've got a request for the B-17 or the B-24 to go to Reading, Pennsylvania. And they would look around and find, you know, a lot of the CF members lived down in the valley at those time, at that time. And they would say, hey, put out a call to everybody involved and say, hey, who wants to fly the B-24 to the Reading, Pennsylvania for the weekend. And they would they would do that. Everybody would get together and the air show, you know, the CF would pay for the money and uh, for the fuel. And then the they would get reimbursed by the air show later. And if there was any money left over, they could put it into the airplane. But generally, they did these kind of things for expenses. Um, Ronnie Gardner told me one time he showed up at air show. They needed to fly the airplane. He showed up at air show and the last signature in the logbook was when he had signed it off the year prior. The airplane hadn't moved in a solid year. And when I told him that I'd found all these old log books, this was several years ago, Ronnie goes, oh, Brad. He goes, don't ever show anyone my signature in those log books. He says, there's probably some things signed off back then that we probably shouldn't have signed off. But <laughs> today, very, very, very well taken care of. She's living the life Diamond Lil has always deserved to have. She's living yep. it now. 1979, this is a HU-16 Albatross, and the Chilean Air Force called and said, hey, we've got some Albatrosses. Y'all want any? And so they, the CF went down there, Art McKinley and Jack Skipper and somebody else, I can't remember who the other guy was, Jim Cooney. They went down and picked this airplane up in Chile 
where they were using it as a anti-submarine warfare plane. And they flew it back to the back to Texas. They flew it at the San Antonio first and then took it back down to Harlingen and kept it for a couple of years. But it didn't fit the mission at the time. It was worth a lot of money, cost a lot to operate, but it was worth a lot of money. So we ended up selling it. And uh, it's still around today. So I think it's in Minnesota, but that same airplane's still around today. But one of the funny things is one of the guys who was one of the CF pilots on that got in trouble with the FAA for doing uh, unauthorized instruction and doing type ratings and check rides off of a lake somewhere down in central Texas. The CF didn't know he was using the airplane. They had left it at this guy's shop to do some work on it. And this guy put about 30 hours on it, making money selling check rides for people. And he wasn't supposed to be doing it, but didn't matter. He did it anyway. But the airplane's still around today. But I just thought it was neat that at one point we did own a did own an albatross in the CF. This is the PBY Catalina. You know, the CF has owned, I think, six, maybe seven PBYs over the years. This one was was very well known. This is what most people will remember. Um, a guy named Mike Wansey who lived down in New Zealand is the guy who purchased this airplane and donated it to the CAF. And like in 1983, 82 or 83, it flew down, it went all the way down to Australia and New Zealand on a, you know, on a, on a tour of the, of the South Pacific and all that. And the CAF had this airplane and flew it for several years up until around 1987 or 88 or something like that. And it had some bad corrosion to it. It was what was called a land sea air lot, a yacht. It was converted to be a flying yacht, very fancy interior and all this kind of stuff. And this is a really nice airplane, but because it had been operated out of salt water for so many years, it had a lot of corrosion issues. But the CF had it up until we left Harlingen and it was still sitting in Brownville, uh, Brown, uh, Brownsville at the time. That's what it looked like. Most people will remember it in those colors. And uh, it ended up getting scrapped uh, because of the corrosion. And people who remember Gary Austin, who used to be the B-29, B-24 crew chief, people remember he had in his yard down in Midland what was called the Stratolina, which was a, he had the front end of a C-97 Stratoliner, and then he had this PBY, the, the scrapped remains of it. And he attached the wings of this to the C-97, and from the air it looked like an airplane, and he called it his, his Stratolina, a combination of a strata, Stratoliner and a Catalina. Um, the airplane ended up going to the Pima Air Museum. It traded hands a couple of times. The remains ended up at the Pima Air Museum. And here not long ago, it got cut up and uh, the fuselage was cut up and used to make key tag, you know, plane tags out of. You'll see them for sale, the plane tags. The ones off the PBY are actually this airplane right now, right here. It was kind of a sad ending to that airplane, but, you know, they, it's, so you can't save everything. Sometimes the corrosion is just too bad. This is a skydiver jumping out of Fifi out the nose wheel. And I put this in here because this is something we would never, ever, ever be allowed to do today. In fact, our operating limitations on Fifi specifically forbid skydivers. There's always ways around it. But these guys wanted to jump out of the nose wheel. And I forgot what the special occasion was. It was like the guy's 1,000th jump or something like that. I've got pictures of him inside the airplane, and I've got all the paperwork for it. But this is kind of... Uh, I just thought this was kind of a neat picture, and I knew it happened then, of this guy falling out of the nose of a B-29. It's probably the last time anyone bailed out of a B-29, and hopefully no one ever will have to. But I just thought that was kind of an interesting picture from, from 1979, or 78. How exactly did he get out? Through the nose gear hatch. Whenever you're sitting in the flight end, you lift the nose gear hatch up towards you, and that, and it, uh, it, or I'm sorry, up away from you in the engineer's position, and he just dives head first out the out the thing. It was the it's how you build out of the airplane during the war. There, the engineer's got a separate switch that you flip that actually, because the landing gear is electric, will actually extend just the nose gear alone, and then you open the hatch up and bail out. And that's exactly what they did. So I wouldn't want to do it, yeah. but. It's, I'm sure glad they took pictures of it when it happened because nobody believes me. I tell them that, that it happened and no one believes me. Well, there's the picture right there. That's why so, I put it on here. I know there's people watching this tonight who, who don't believe me that this happened. That's why I wanted to put the picture in there. So it was just a, a single a single skydiver or were there more than one that came out? 
was just, I think there was two. There was one jumped out the nose and one jumped out the APU hatch in the back. Okay. Which would be far easier to get out of. Yeah. This here, I put this in here for kind of a reason. I could, somewhere I've got a uniform that has this sewed on the back of it and I, I couldn't find it today. Um, in 1979, the wing staff conference was held, which, you know, ours is coming up in February and then we've had them every year since then. But 1979, that's when we uh, had the very first one. At the time, everyone still had the Confederate flags on the back of their uniform and it was still the Confederate Air Force. This patch right here, the reason that exists today is it was designed at such a size that it was not required, but it was an additional uniform item you could buy for your additional year for your official CF uniform. It would go over the Confederate flag on the back and cover it completely. So you could be, I don't know, I hate to say politically correct, but I guess that would have been what it was. If you didn't want the Confederate flag, you could have that on the back and it would cover the Confederate flag. So they made it the size they did so you didn't have to buy a whole new uniform. It wasn't mandatory. It was, I don't even know that it was highly encouraged. But the Wing Staff Conference in 1979 is when that flag patch was was uh, first shown so that people could put it on. And when I was a kid, I remember seeing a lot of these patches on there. And I didn't know the reason behind it. But that's I found it out a couple of years later. But that's what it was. It was to get rid of the Confederate flag. Of course, they didn't all go away for a long time after that. But you know, 1979 there, so... There was 527 people commissioned at that air show. You know, we're talking earlier about 230 being commissioned in 1977. There's 530 commissioned um, at this one. Um, the 1980s were just around the corner. This all happened in October, you know. The New Zealand wing formed. It was the first overseas wing in the CF. The Australian wing formed right after that. Some things were starting to change. The CF is now becoming an international organization. Um, Tennessee Ernie Ford, who everybody knew at the time, he was a huge country singer, 1979, he did his first air show announcing act and everything like that. So that brought more attention and national prominence to the CAF. And uh, it was it was very much the end of an era. And then in the 80s, you started getting into more moving forward, but also it becoming such an expensive thing to do that it was getting harder for the CF to stay running. And the 1980s is when the very, the first real financial problems came along. And so the 70s in a way, kind of the end of an era for a lot of, a lot of reasons. Well, and uh, next time around, we'll talk about the, uh, the tumultuous uh, 1980s. Uh, and, uh, and Brad, we appreciate you taking us through the 70s. We've got a, a couple of questions here from, uh, from the audience. Uh, going okay. back to the, um, the atomic bomb simulation in uh, 1976. How exactly did they did they do that? Do you know? The the, the pyro guys have yeah. always done it the same. Just a, it's just a matter of you know gasoline and explosives. Bill McCoy was the guy who ran the pyro team at the time. It wasn't like we have the blasters and the EOD guys. It was a different sort of setup back then. I don't know what it was, but it's just a lot of you know, diesel and gas and, and dynamite mixed together, I guess. But it, they did it very well. Something they do special to give it the mushroom appearance. And I've seen them do it several times over the years where you just see this ball of fire go up and just roll out of the top of the cloud and then it all turn into white smoke. And if that's even a glimpse of what it looks like in real life, it must have been purely the most terrifying thing to ever see. I can't imagine and don't want to imagine it. But as is is scary as it could look to a little kid at an air show, in real life it must be a terrifying thing. Yeah. Um, do you know of any opportunities uh, with the CAF in commemorating the the uh, anniversary of the the bomb drop relating to Dutch Van Kirk, uh, navigator for uh, Paul Tibbets, and uh, I believe he I signed the the map on the navigator's table in Fifi as well. He did. Dutch Dutch flew with us. Uh, well, he had a chance to fly with us back in the 80s, and he made the comment. He goes, I don't know. He said, uh, you know, I was talking a while ago about how expensive things were in the 80s. He made the comment. He goes, I don't know. That airplane doesn't look to be in that good a shape to me. And he said, I've flown in some B-29s that when they were brand new didn't need to be flying. He said, I think I'll just bypass the ride. And then later on, he, he flew with us just here a few years passed away. 
but he came to air show many, many times over the years. He was, uh, um, he was, he never, I don't know if he was ever a CF member, but he came and set up and signed autographs and all that kind of stuff. And when he sold his book, he came and did that. He, uh, he made a lot of appearances with us. He just didn't, he just didn't have the notoriety of Paul Tibbet, right. and, and Paul Tibbet's just won't fly the B-29 again. And I, Dutch Van Kirk, there wasn't the need for him to navigate it again, but he right. did ride with us. That's good. Um, it, here's one I, I hadn't heard of before. What was the Golden Fleece Award with CAF? You know, I don't know, but I have okay. seen that. I have seen that written down on the list of things. I found the other day, I found a whole other list of awards that I don't know what all of them are. So I don't know how many were serious and how many were jokes about, you know, the awards weren't all serious, but I think some of them were, that didn't really exist. They were jokes that they had, but I, I'm going to have to research the Golden Police Award because I've been asked that before and I genuinely don't know. All right. Well, Brad, uh, it is, uh, we're just about out of time. Any uh, final thoughts in the 1970s before we sign off? Yeah. Uh, you know, with the picture of the sun going down on the, on the seventies, one of the things that came out of Air Show 79 when they did the planning for it, they were all worried about Air Show 79 being very successful because it was going to be really expensive to have it. Bulk gasoline for the airplanes was now going to be in excess of $1 a gallon. And so that's kind of the end of the 70s with the gas embargo and everything else. They were worried about a dollar a gallon. I've, I would I would sell my soul for a dollar a gallon to fill Fifi up with fifty two hundred and eighty gallons of gas. That's so true. I thought that was a neat, a good thing to end the seventies on was gas was still a dollar a gallon. Amazing. Well, Brad, we'll we'll get together and do this again in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll take a look at the uh, the nineteen eighties, and we do appreciate you uh, sharing your knowledge and all the the great artifacts and things that you've uh, you've collected over the years. And uh, like I said, we'll look forward to uh, taking a peek at the eighties. I appreciate it. I thank you all for having me. Yeah. And thanks again for joining us for another Warbird Tube webinar. If you have any suggestions for a future guest or a topic you'd like us to cover, just drop Leah Block an email at uh, media at cafhq.org. We'll be back next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Central Time. Until then, thanks again to Brad Pilgrim for being our guest tonight. For the CAF, I'm Steve Buss. Good night.